Lance worship team for prompting us and telling us to worship today. You know, I just really like the idea of living under the smile of God. I don't know if you remember about three, four weeks ago, Dave was speaking and uh, talking about this elderly gentleman and, and another person was with him and, and this elderly gentleman was just smiling away. And the younger person asked him, well, why are you smiling? And the elderly gentleman said, God is so fond of me. <laughs> and you know, he is. If you are in Christ, he is incredibly fond of you. Friends, we live under his smile because of Christ. So when you think of God, think of him smiling upon you because of the righteousness of Christ. You know, it also occurred to me, you know, we also live under the smile of our neighbors when we treat them with the values that are being talked about in the book of Proverbs. And it also occurred to me last night as I was talking to a lady at a neighborhood party and she, she was saying that in her retirement years, she's getting out and doing volunteerism in our community in all sorts of different places. And she's discovering that as she writes in her journal, it's like she's smiling in her heart. Because when you're out doing things for other people, you're usually more joyful. So friends, I think it's great to live under the smile of God, the smile of our neighbors, and yes, even the smile of our own hearts. You know, in his commentary on the book of Proverbs, uh, Paul Koptak says this, we must learn to talk about the goodness of sex and the essential goodness of boundaries in a culture that makes too much of sex and too little of boundaries. Well, this morning I would like to talk about the goodness of sex and yes, the essential goodness of boundaries. And I'd like to do that from the Old Testament book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 5. So I encourage you to open your Bibles this morning to Proverbs chapter 5. And you know, if you don't have a Bible, you can take one for free. They're sitting over there on the shelf. They're a big black Bible, large print. You don't need to, to worry about glasses when you have one of those. Anyways, uh, I'll also have the script, uh, the text up behind, this, behind me this morning on the screen. So let's dig in this morning. Let's open our hearts up to what we can learn from Proverbs chapter 5. It begins this way. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips preserve knowledge. In other words, son, be teachable. Be willing to learn from just about everyone. Wisdom's calling out everywhere. Have ears to hear. Be willing to learn. And you know, this is really a major theme that runs through Proverbs. I talked about that last week. And it's such a wonderful thing, because when you're open to advice and you're open to correction, you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. Teachability is the path to wisdom. And wisdom is all about skillful living. This week I received a, a very encouraging email from a young lady who worshipped with us really for all her life. She's now living in Vancouver. In her email she said, I'm going to quote her now, God has so gently, I love the way she said that, so gently encouraged me to surrender my control over to him. I feel more moldable than ever. I want to develop the passions and skills that God has given me. And boy, we want every young person, every person who attends Summit, to let God develop the skills and passions he has given you, and you'll make a difference in this community. And this he also says, I'm so excited for what God is doing in me and as well for the things he's preparing for me. Friends, these are the words of a teachable young person. A person who's on the path of wisdom. The very thing the father is wanting of his sons. In particular, he wants his sons to have discretion. Boy, that's a great word. Discretion is all about having wise judgment. And he, he wants his sons to have knowledge, the knowledge of right and wrong. Because he knows that throughout his sons, their sons, entire life, they'll be facing temptation. And that's what he talks about in the next verse. Proverbs 5, verse 3. For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech, speech is smoother than oil. 
And by the way, you kind of find a verse like this four times in the book of Proverbs. She's described as a really smooth, convincing talker. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. She's lethal. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths wander aimlessly. But she doesn't even know it. Do you sense the father is using fear as a tactic here? So maybe some hyperbola, exaggeration for effect, to keep his son away from sexual temptation? I sure think so. Especially when he says, her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. In other words, giving in to her seductive words will have dire consequences. Apparently in the ancient Near East, it was very common for dads to write letters to their sons, warning them about sexual temptation. There's many examples. Let me just share one with you here this morning. I think this one's from either Mesopotamia or Egypt. Beware of a woman who is a stranger, one not known in her own town. Don't stare at her when she goes by. Don't know her carnally. A deep water whose course is unknown. Such is a woman away from her husband. I am pretty, she tells you daily, when she has no witnesses. She is ready to ensnare you. A deadly crime when it is heard. Obviously a quote that's very reflective of the passage we're looking at here this morning. The father who's writing this passage is obviously well steeped in the Old Testament laws, especially the Ten Commandments. Yes, the Seventh Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. So over and over again in this book, he warns his sons of the dangers of giving into sexual invitations. And I say over and over again because if you were to pick up your Bible and do some counting, there would be 75 verses in this book we call Proverbs that relate to this topic of avoiding inappropriate relationships. All of chapter 7, all of chapter 5, a good part of chapter 6, four verses in chapter 2, and some in verse chapter 23. And, and you know, as I reflected on it this week, I, I think I was, it was in the evening sometime, I started about thinking about this lady who appears in every culture, at every period of time, and I wonder, is she also a victim? A victim of a bad marriage, a victim of neglect, a victim of abuse. Is she a person with deep emotional wounds? And you know what? So very likely she is. But that's not the father's concern in chapter 5. It's the father's concern that his sons avoid this person throughout their entire life because he knows of the dire consequences, and he also knows there's a far better way to express one's sexuality. A topic he continues to build upon in the following verses. Now then, my sons, listen to me. I'm having a trouble with this line, listen to me, because uh, someone recently showed me, someone's laughing in the front row here already. If you go on YouTube and, and, and type in listen Linda, <laughs> okay, you see it, you see it. And every time I see that word listen, I'm thinking of this little, cute little uh, vignette there. Anyways, it's really quite funny. You need to go on and watch it. But anyways, I've got to get above this. My sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Lest you, you lose your honor to others and your dignity to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth, and your toil enrich the house of another. Once again, the Father is saying, giving in to her will have dire consequences. Giving in to her will cost you your honor and your dignity, as well maybe the respect of others, if people catch wind of your behavior. Furthermore, there will be financial consequences, and I'm not exactly sure what he's getting at here, but the bottom line is this. Inappropriate relationships will cost you in some way. You know, as I reflected on this particular passage here, 
it occurred to me that my preaching professor from 25 years ago, my brilliant preaching professor, lost his career and ministry because he didn't take the message of Proverbs 5 seriously. In the following verses, the father continues to build on the consequences of inappropriate behavior when he writes, verse 11, at the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. In other words, in old age, as you look back on your life, you will say, how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. And I was soon in serious trouble in the assembly of God's people. In essence, the Father is saying that giving into temptation will lead to regret, regret, regret. And that was certainly true of the Old Testament character named King David, this very famous king. One night he committed an offense against another man's wife. Her name was Bathsheba. David, of course, suffered the consequences of his behavior. And you, and you kind of read, as you read Psalm 51, you sense the deep regret that's hovering over his heart and mind when he says, my sin is always before me. But as the story goes, and, and this is a great message, friends, God forgave him when he confessed. God restored him. And God even said about this character, David, he is now a man after my own heart which should so greatly encourage any one of us. Whenever we've blown it in life, when we've made a huge mistake, God forgives. And he can restore us so he looks upon us now as men and women of God. But I'm sure David regretted his decision to sleep with Bathsheba for the rest of his life. To some degree, he had the sense of regret. And friends, that's the very thing that a loving father doesn't want for his children. He doesn't want them to have a lot of regret. And that's why the father in this passage is passionately calling his sons and he asks his daughters to listen. And now, in the following verses, the father teaches his son a far better way to live. A wiser way to express their sexuality. And now it's full of metaphors. All you literary people, you'll appreciate the metaphors. I would have preferred, preferred straightforward speech but anyways, here's how he says it. Drink water from your own cistern. Running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone and never to be shared with a stranger. And when these three verses, the father using metaphorical language to say, find sexual pleasure at home. Yes, drinking water, verse 15, becomes a metaphor for faithful sexual expression with one's spouse. Furthermore, verse 16, the intimate relationship his son will one day enjoy with his spouse should not go public, not into the streets. Sharing your sexuality with strangers, with some other than your wife, is not wise behavior. An ideal reaffirmed over and over again in the New Testament, in the teachings of Jesus, in the teachings of Paul, and I would like to suggest also an ideal affirmed in our hearts as well. Even when we make mistakes, we still point our lives back to an ideal. This is what I would really be my preferred behavior. And now in the next three verses, he continues to build on the positive. Again, we full of metaphors. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may your breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated. I love that word. Intoxicated with her love. Boy, that's a strong word. Why, my son, be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? Once again, the father's using metaphor, and this time a water image, a fountain to describe the refreshing nature of physical intimacy within the context of marriage. Likewise, he calls his son to rejoice in the wife of their youth. And yes, rejoice in her after 10 years of marriage, after 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years of marriage. Oh yeah, sexual expression will look a little different 30, 40, 50 years in. But still, make it happen. 
And what does it actually mean to rejoice in one's wife? Oh, there's so many words. But you know, I think one of the greatest words is delight. Delight in your spouse. And they know, they know when you are delighting in them. Friends, the father is offering some really good, timely advice to his son. Furthermore, the father hopes that his sons will enjoy their wife's exquisite body. By the way, a body that's been designed by God to be really attractive to a female, I mean to a male. <laughs> you know, I once attended a wedding. And during the reception, during the reception, the father got up and prayed a prayer over this young couple. It was his daughter and now his son-in-law. And, and it was a beautiful prayer, prayer of blessing. But what really caught my attention is he's praying this prayer of blessing. He prays, and may they have a great sex life. I think everyone in the word room heard that. <laughs> but you know what? That's the very thing that the father is hoping and wishing upon this young couple. Yes, be intoxicated, my son. Be consumed with what they have to offer you. And if for a moment we allow the Apostle Paul to weigh in on the discussion here this morning, he would say, sons, make sure that it's a mutually satisfying experience. When it comes to sex, the golden rule really, really applies. Finally, in verse 20, the father asks the sons two rhetorical questions, and the answer is obvious. Why be intoxicated with another man's wife? Why embrace the bosom of a wayward woman? And the answer, based on everything he said so far, is simply this. In light of the sheer joy to be found with one's wife, and all the trouble associated with the adultery, with adultery, the sons would be foolish to give in to the seductive words of this wayward woman. And now the father concludes by saying this, for your way, sons, are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them, the cords of sin, their sin hold them fast, and it's almost like a picture of a trapper. Maybe got a rabbit or some small animal in his trap, and now he's just waiting for the hunter to show up. That's the picture he's trying to portray for us here in 22. And then 23, for lack of dis discipline they will die, led astray by their own great folly. In other words, if you give in, be sure your sins will find you out. My son, God knows everything. As you live out your life, he's watching you. He knows your every motive, your every movement. Sons, bring a smile to his face. Furthermore, as I've already said to you, sons, sin will have some very negative consequences. So I ask, is the father once again trying to scare his son out of foolish behavior into wise behavior? And you know what? I think he is. And you know, that's not such a bad thing sometimes. Can you guys remember when you went to your first shop course in school? And they usually show you this video of what happens to people around machinery. I don't know how they acted that out, but you know, there's limbs and blood everywhere. I tell you what, I don't, I don't forget that. I'm, I'm far removed from that situation. When I use a skill saw, I'm holding on with two hands. There is nothing on my body that's going to get cut. And I think that's what the father's doing. He sees the danger, and he wants his son to avoid it. Well, let me summarize. Here's what I think the father is saying to the sons, or his sons. My sons, if you listen to me, you will gain discretion. The discretion you will need to avoid temptations in life. Yes, you'll avoid the adulterous woman, and as well, the negative consequences of giving in to her. But more importantly, if you listen to what I have to say, you will learn to find pleasure at home. Yes, the joy and delight God has designed for you in the context of marriage. Friends, the message of Proverbs is not just for young men living 2,800 years ago. The message of Proverbs is for, well, men and women of all ages at every period of history. It's a timeless message aimed at teaching followers of Jesus Christ of the dangers of adultery, but more importantly, of the beauty and goodness of sex within the context of marriage. Friends, we obviously live in a culture 
where there's so much sexual brokenness. A culture where one out of every five college girls will be sexually assaulted in some way before graduation, that's just insane. A, a culture where one out of every two marriages is affected by adultery. A culture where God's good gift of sex is being used and expressed in ways that are hurtful to people. Did you know that there is more money spent on pornography than there is spent on movie tickets and professional sports such as basketball, football, and baseball combined? Like, I can't get my head around that. 13 years ago, it was a $14, $14 billion industry in the United States. Friends, you might imagine how that breaks God's heart. Not to mention its many victims, including the users themselves. So I pray, Heavenly Father, help us to think clearly about sex. Help us to express it in a way that will, in very tender ways, nourish our relationship. That's one of the great purposes of sex. It bonds people. It nourishes their relationship. You know, before I wrap up here this morning, I'm going to invite two of our young adults to come forward. Uh, this week I threw a couple of questions out to two of our young adults and asked them to come here this morning and respond. And I'm going to ask Ben to go first. And I've given this question to Ben. What do you appreciate about the father's advice to his son and why? And to, then to Laura McCannish, I'm going to ask the question... <laughs> Would you want to marry a young man who took this passage seriously? And if so, why? Go ahead, Ben. All right. So for me, I guess as a, as a young, unmarried man, um, as I kind of read through Proverbs 5 and just was reflecting on the text, um, one of the verses that really jumped out to me was verse 8. Um, Sol or Solomon, or the father, uh, just describes this adulterous woman. And then he simply says, keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. He's simply saying, stay away. Just don't even go there. And, um, you know, I think that this verse is really helpful just in terms of thinking about uh, how to respond to sexual temptation, how to live with sexual purity and walk in the way of righteousness in the way that God wants us to, um, just in general. Um, you know, as, as Harry's been talking about, uh, we live in a world where uh, there's a lot of sexual, sexual brokenness, we might say. And um, we live in a really hyper-sexualized culture, actually. And it seems like sexual temptation is almost kind of lurking kind of everywhere you are or everywhere you go almost. Um, you know, it's, it's in the mall, it's on TV, it's in movies, it's in books, it's in magazines, it's on every advertisement that you see. Um, it's obviously everywhere on the internet, you know, Sex sells, I guess, right? And um, sometimes it almost maybe seems impossible to live with sexual purity, maybe. But um, I don't think that it, I actually don't think that it is. And um, you know, the the verse here, keep to a path far from the adulterous woman. I think in the same way we can say uh, that this verse is saying to us, keep to a path far from uh, situations and places where you're going to be tempted sexually. And, um, you know, we, we truly can uh, seek to do that in, in many practical ways, I guess. And for me, you know, this has looked like just choosing not to watch certain movies or certain TV shows at all. And, you know, turning my head away from the TV when certain things come up. Um, just not even looking at certain advertisements. Um, when I go to the mall, just staying away from Victoria's Secret. You gotta watch out for that one. <laughs> um, you know, for a lot of my friends too, some of my friends that I've talked talked through about some of these issues, it's meant just not even going on their laptop at all after nine o'clock in, in the evening or something like that. And uh, for some of my friends, it's meant just deleting apps off their phones. Um, I think that sometimes drastic measures really do need to be taken in order to live life with sexual purity and to, uh, to stay free from sexual temptation and live the life that God has called us to. So, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. I'm answering the second question. Do you want to marry a young man who took this passage seriously? If so, why? And I guess I would. Um, <laughs> men, when you set physical boundaries in a dating relationship, you show a woman 
that you respect her, that you value her, and that her future is important to you. It is incredibly attractive to have a guy verbalize that he has set high standards for himself, but also that he intends to honor the clear physical boundaries set in a relationship. And when we create physical boundaries when we're dating, single, dating, we want them to be both specific and measurable. And examples that friends have given me is no lying down. It's as simple as that. No taking clothes off, no touching bathing suit areas. Um, next thing I'd like to share is just a text that a guy had sent me that I really appreciated and that warmed my heart after I'd shared my physical boundaries. Um, I just thought that you should know that if we do have a future together, that it'd be on, an honor to protect the things that you have saved yourself for. Um, and I know that some of you and myself included have made mistakes and that there is um, forgiveness for that and healing um, that comes with that and, and a renewal in terms of the boundaries that we want to set for ourselves. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, Ben and Laura. And, you know, one of the lines that Laura used that I thought was really great, and guys, you should hear this. Remember when she says, it is incredibly attractive, incredibly attractive to have a guy verbalize that he not only set high standards for himself and previous relationships, but also intends to honor you in the same way. I think the word attractive is, is awesome. Anyways, in closing, let me just wrap up here this morning. You know, when we teach from the Old Testament, we try to read the Old Testament through the lens of the New, and I think even more so through the eyes of the lens of the Gospel. And that's something I'm trying to learn. I want to learn and do it better in years to come. And I think everyone who's preaching from this pulpit in years to come, we're going to preach the Gospel. Uh, from every passage of scripture possible. But you know, when you think of this topic before us this morning, and I think, you know, there's this wonderful word in the gospel, and it's called forgiveness. And, uh, you know, as the New Testament proclaimers uh, so boldly said, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Like, isn't that awesome? Yes, our every failure in life, Yes, our every failure to live out the message of Proverbs 5, whether in thought, remember Jesus raised the bar here for us guys and women, every violation in either thought or in deed is forgiven through what Christ has done for us. And we need to celebrate that forgiveness. Secondly, you know, we also read Proverbs chapter 5 through the wonderful New Testament truth that the Holy Spirit indwells us. Friends, the Holy Spirit seeks to produce character in a person's life so that they, in fact, will resist temptation to express their sexuality in a wrong way. Yes, to give us the type of character that enables us to be faithful and loving towards our spouses. As Paul wrote to the churches in the province of Galatia, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace Forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and yes, self-control. The Spirit, God's presence in us, enables us to be the type of people who can resist all forms of wrong and conversely delight in what is good. And that includes being faithful to our spouses for life. Finally, this I want to say this. I like to read Proverbs chapter 5 in light of what God is wanting to do in and through us. Friends, our God is a missionary God. And he wants us to join us. He wants us to join him on mission. And you know, that's so very true because you can all articulate, I think, fairly clearly, when God came and called you to himself. And you knew it was God and not anyone else. God is calling people to himself. Remember what Jesus said before leaving this planet for a position at the right hand of the Father. He said this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. Friends, God wants us to be his witnesses to the fact that he's reconciling the world to himself in Christ. 
And without a doubt, a life, a witness, characterized by wisdom, will be a much more credible witness. So friends, God has given us the book of Proverbs so that we would walk in wisdom, that we'd skillfully live life, and yes, be credible witnesses to his love. And now I'd like to close in prayer this morning with a prayer I wrote in response to Proverbs chapter 5. I'm going to pray it slowly this morning and uh, give you a chance to think about what I'm praying. And in the depths of your own heart, if you could say amen to any of these lines, I encourage you to do so. You can even say it out loud if you want. Would you bow in prayer with me? Father, give us a teachable spirit Amen. that we may have lives full of wisdom. Amen. Give us both discretion and knowledge so that we may understand the dangers of giving in to sexual temptation. Amen. Help us to avoid compromising situations. Amen. Teach us the beauty of marital love. May we all understand that sexual pleasure is a gift from you. Where we have failed to express our sexuality in healthy ways, forgive us, Father. Forgive us because of Jesus Christ. Heal our thought lives. Restore our sexuality to a place of wholeness. Father, may you be honored by the way we express our sexuality. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.